Good morning. Thank you for coming out before flying home. <laughs> uh, so this is, of course, application level benchmarking with spec SFS 2014. Uh, if this is not your flight, you should leave now. No, <laughs> glad you're here. I'm Nick Prince of Paper. Uh, I presented last year with Spencer. Uh, this year we also have... Yeah, I'm Vernon Miller, IBM, also in the spec SFS subcommittee. Um, and uh, so we're both officers on the subcommittee and we actually have additional at least Ken, who's also on the SFS subcommittee from NetApp here as well. So we're well represented. So today we want to talk about uh, basically, first I want to cover why we're talking about application level benchmarking and then roll into what exactly I mean by application level benchmarking. And then as, as hard as it is for me to imagine, not all of you may be familiar intimately with the details of the spec SFS 2014 workload, so I want to just do a real quick refresher on that, as well as uh, disclosure, just a real quick detour to um, disclosure and reporting of results, just to clarify um, some issues there. Uh, <clears throat> Vernon will then take over and talk about testing a storage solution. We're going to get into what we mean by storage solution uh, later. And then he's also going to walk you through the conceptual ramifications of doing application, application level benchmarking. And then I think about 60% of the content is hard data from mm -hmm. two different environments from two different companies. We're going to actually walk you through um, the different layers of the storage stack of, of two different storage solutions. So lots of data to get to. SPEC is the Standard Performance Evaluation Corporation, but we just call it SPEC. It's a nonprofit brings together industry and academia. Um, and the, the main goal is to create industry standard benchmarks for all sorts of things. Uh, we, of course, in SFS focus on storage performance. Uh, used to just be NAS performance, but now we're just focused on storage and storage solutions. So not necessarily just file anymore. So why am I here talking about application level benchmarking? Uh, that's basically because uh, we've completely changed the underpinning, underpinnings of SFS. Uh, not the same load generator at all anymore. Um, and because of that, the load is now generated at the application level. And the aim of the benchmark has changed to measure the performance of a whole storage solution. All the way from the load generators, which are now included as part of that storage solution, all the way down to the disks. And now vendors, you really have the flexibility to configure the, the benchmark to better match your environment. So this gets back to uh, you don't have to uh, benchmark just a, a NAS server anymore. Um, and you can control, uh, control the benchmark to put the bottleneck where you want to show value for your product, whatever your product is. And the increased flexibility of application level benchmarking really is to address the increase in complexity of storage solutions. There are more and more data services uh, available in storage arrays, and uh, simply the architectures are more and more diverse. Uh, it's not just, I'm from EMC, so I like to talk about scale up storage and scale out storage. Um, there's also hyperconverged storage and uh, software defined storage, of course. We've heard about a lot of those this week. Um, and protocols keep evolving. Every release of Windows is a new dialect of SMB. So to accurately capture those nuances, having the operating system actually take care of that translation uh, lets you capture the nuances. So if you want to test the new version of SMB, you simply change your load generator operating system. And you automatically get the latest version of everything. Also, fairness to all implementations. So now, if you're testing a NAS server, you can get valid results and comparable results. But now you can also extend that to other architectures and other implementations. Scale up, scale out, it doesn't really matter. You can now configure the benchmark in the best way for your solution. And we sort of feel that, we really feel that any other approach is no longer appropriate for industry standard benchmarking, not performance testing. But for benchmarking, if you can't have a consistent uh, load definition and a consistent benchmark that works the same for a hyperconverged solution, a scale-out solution, software-defined solution, 
you can't really call yourself an industry standard benchmark. If you only work on a monolithic NAV server now, that's, that's becoming a smaller and smaller part of the market. So because we are an industry standard benchmark, we really need to cover all of the available architectures, protocols, and everything we just talked about. So I've touched on this a little bit. Uh, prior to SFS 2014, the benchmark generated its own SMB and NFS traffic. Uh, it inserted itself basically right above the NICs in the OS, which was great for generating a lot of load with very measly little clients. Um, the problem is that limits the focus to only a NAS server uh, because it, the benchmark has its own idea of what it wants to be doing and what the different NFS dialects and, and SIF dialects are. Um, so you really can only test a monolithic NAS server. You couldn't test any local storage or anything like that. So now we're using uh, NetMist, the underlying uh, load generator, uses native OS calls to generate uh, application level load. So it behaves like a real application. The data and metadata ops requested are processed by the operating system. And this changes the focus to the storage performance of the whole solution because now that load generator operating system is involved in the workload. So in this case, it means that the client has tremendous impact on, uh, on the result. Right? Can. Can have tremendous impact. And we'll see sort of where, we'll actually show you real data where there was an impact and some data where there was absolutely no impact. And it actually, the workload that you're running has a, has a uh, great impact on whether the load generating operating system really affects the workload at all. Um, so just a reminder, uh, the presentation last year, which sort of introduced the benchmark uh, right before release, that video is available on spec.org slash SFS 2014. Totally free, you can just go watch it whenever you want. And that's a very detailed intro to the architecture. I just want to quickly touch the workloads. We have four workloads, database, software build, uh, VDA, VDI. Database and VDI are both highly random transactional workloads. Uh, the database is OLTP transactional database. So they're very similar workloads for this case. Database winds up working, winds up looking a lot like VDI, so we're not actually going to talk about database. Software build is modeled after uh, either large software project compilation, like I say there, or lots of simultaneous smaller builds. And it's very metadata heavy. Uh, it doesn't do a lot of uh, actual data operations, the ones it does do are whole file reads and writes, like you'd expect from a software build. Uh, VDA is video data acquisition. That simply uh, is a lot of sequential writes. You're ingesting data. It could be video data, that's sort of what we modeled it after, um, or uh, any sort of big data ingest where you're ingesting sensor data that you have to capture right then. So it's large sequential writes with some random reads thrown in, because rarely will you have an absolutely pure random, or sequential write environment. And VDI, of course, is just a, a heavy steady state knowledge worker workload, um, not linked clones, but full clones. And I want to touch on, on the requirements of reporting SFS 2014 results. Uh, you can get the benchmark run it in-house and, and do anything you want, but to release results publicly, you do have to follow the license the run and reporting rules for the benchmark and the fair use rules, and we do encourage submission to spec. Um, certain information is required to be disclosed, so you have to, you know, if you've ever seen a spec result, you sort of, the top part of that report, the business metrics versus the average response time and the overall response time, you're required to report those. And you can also report anything you want in addition to that. Um, but there are rules, um, basically just don't use this presentation as a guide. Because we're breaking the rules a little bit because uh, the presentation is created for educational purposes um, under the auspices of spec. I know we're EMC and IBM, but we're using generic environments that and we're not trying to sell you them. We're just trying to show you what the workloads look like in real environments. All right, so how do you test a, a storage solution? Um, with this benchmark compared to SFS 2008, since the load generators play a more active role, uh, you have to pay closer attention to how the system's configured from the you know from the, the the disk all the way up to the load generator and the key is to put the bottleneck in the right place 
you might not always know where that is. We'll talk about that later. Um, in addition, since the, the environments are so open-ended, uh, if you do want to publish, a lot of those configuration details need to be documented, which didn't need to be before. So it's important to kind of keep track at each, each step, the um, configuration and tuning details. Um, so SFS 2014, it's still a very storage centric benchmark. Uh, there's no, it, it doesn't try to do any compute load. The, the file um, access patterns are still, you know, very heavy on stressing the, the backend storage. So some, some consequences of running the, the benchmark at the application level. The most important one is, is that the, the load generator um, really does matter. Uh, since it's in the data path from, from the beginning, any little detail can uh, potentially affect the performance. So some of that would include, of course, the, um, the storage connectivity, network connectivity, but even um, the OS version, you know, minor revisions, patch levels, um, in addition to the, the, the typical things, how much memory do you have, how many clients are you using. Um, the benefit, though, is that since it runs at the application level and all that's required is a file API, you can run on, on basically anything. Um, so certainly the traditional NAS server, you can also um, run against a block storage device, just put a file system on top and you're ready to go. Um, also hyperconverged or even a, a wall of servers, each with their own storage. They have no sharing whatsoever. You, you could do that if, if you wished. So great power comes great responsibility. Again, the, the, the important thing is to know where the bottleneck is. Um, so part of that is going to be determined by the configuration. The other part is going to be determined by how the load is, is placed on the system. In uh, previous versions, there was a, a uniform access rule that restricted how load could um, be distributed against the backend resources. That's since been lifted, so you can really spread load however you want. Um, in a lot of cases, it's going to be like the old benchmark. You typically do want to spread the load across as many storage resources as possible, but um, there could be some cases where as the load ramps up, you want to put, uh, you, you want to shift the load to some other part of the storage, and that's that's completely uh, possible with SFS 2014, and it's mainly controlled by the client mount points parameter, um, which is just a list of load generators and, and working directories. So we've already mentioned putting the bottleneck where you want to show value, but. Um, if you're like me, you usually don't don't have any idea where that's going to be at the at the start. So a, a lot of what we're going to show here is um, performance at, at multiple levels of the of the solution. Um, and so a, a good idea is just to run the benchmark, collect data at as, ma at as many places as you can to to help understand where the benchmarks are. So you, you get the application level data from SFS 2014 itself, um, but some other layers where you might want to collect would be the backend disk, the um, NAS server if you have one, hypervisor, really anytime there's a, either a physical transition, a protocol transition, or even uh, a transition between major software components in a, in a single physical uh, component. And you may see different levels of performance at the various levels of the stack. Um, each each layer has the potential to change the change the workload, and we'll definitely see that in in the data. So now we'll get into the the two environments that we used. Uh, one was at EMC, one was at IBM, and so for each of these two environments, um, we ran well. We ran all the benchmarks. We're going to show three of them, and the um, the two environments were configured in two in two ways. One, a traditional NAS protocol, and the other, a uh, quote-unquote local case uh, where it appears to be local storage from, from the load generator's point of view. So this is environment one, the one at uh, EMC. And I'll, I'll just go into the configuration diagram that illustrates it a little better. So we start off with um, 10 ESX servers. Each server is running two instances of Windows 
those connect over a 10 gig fabric to a NAS server, which in this case is a fairly beefy Windows 2012 server uh, for, the, for the SMB shares. And then the NAS server connects to the backend storage, uh, which is a, a mid-range um, array over eight gig fiber channel. And there's another path to the load generators that bypasses the, the NAS server. Um, so the ESXi servers connect directly to the backend storage and then um, it can, can just mount the LUNs directly, in this case, as, as the E drive on each of the load generators. Were these concurrently mounted or separate tests? Con well, they were, yeah, they were run separately. Well, e yeah, each, each, each VM just had its own LUN and worked against its, its own LUN. This is NTFS file system. So the, the application measurements were taken directly from the load generator. That's what's reported by SFS 2014. Um, the network measurements were, were taken at the NAS server, uh, but, but really it, uh, you get the same results whether you're, you're collecting these at the load generator or the, the server. So that's why we point to the, the switch here. Uh, and the protocol statistics were taken on directly on the Windows server and then the disk measurements from the, the, the disk controller itself. So that was environment one. Environment two was at IBM. In a lot of ways, it's, it's, a lot of, it's fairly similar in terms of scale. But in this case, um, we were testing uh, rather than SMB NFS and comparing that to um, a local case. So what we started out with was a, um, a distributed fi file system uh, on, a, on a clustered, on, on four clustered nodes. There were two types of nodes. Backend nodes connected directly to the backend storage over eight gig fiber channel. The, the nodes themselves talk over um, DDR and Finiband. And then they connect to front end NFS clients over a, a 10 gig network. So in this case, for the first scenario, the NFS tests, the load generators run directly on the NFS clients. And then in the second case, uh, we completely bypass NFS and we run directly on the front end nodes. So for this environment, the application measurements are actually taken at two different places depending on the scenario, either on the NFS clients or the front end nodes. Um, again, the network measurements at the switch level uh, the front end nodes ser were running uh, Red Hat's KNFS, so that's where the server measurements were taken. And then the disk measurements were just taken via IOSTAT on the back end nodes. So now we're going to get kind of into the, the heart of the presentation, which is um, showing the data for these two environments. And we're going to go through three of the workloads. We're going to start with VDA, which is a streaming workload. Uh, then VDI and, and finish up with um, software build. And so um, for each, we'll, we'll kind of go back and forth between the two environments. It'll kind of be like watching a tennis match going back between Nick and I. Um, so this is environment two. This was the, the clustered file system in the NFS case. And what we're looking at here um, is the, the, the data rate. And we're gonna look at, the, at three different levels. So if we look at the um, reads and writes, kilobytes per second from the application point of view, so this is from um, the, the SFS 2014 itself, you can see that there are a lot more writes than reads. It's about a nine to one ratio. That's how it's defined. Um, if we then look at what the network sees, uh, it's clear that there's a little bit of network overhead associated with, uh, with NFS and that, that's expected. And then if we finally overlay what the backend disk is seeing, um, you, you can see that the writes are fairly well aligned with what the application is doing. But at the backend disk, there's slightly more reads uh, occurring in terms of data rate, uh, probably due to prefetching. And if we compare to what happens when we run, when we bypass NFS and run directly on the clustered file system, uh, we get the, the exact same data for the application because we're, we're running the same load points. 
And on the disk, we don't, we don't quite see the same prefetching. They pretty much line up exactly. So we're going to hop over to the Windows environment that I ran in. And we're going to look, stay with VDA and looking at data rates. So we can see again, 9 to 1 ratio, read, reads to writes, or writes to reads. And when we hop up one layer to see how the load generators are affecting the workload that the NAS server sees, you can see the workload's exactly the same. You can't even see the red line anymore that's the application level. When we look at what the disks are doing, we actually see the same write workload, but we can see the NAS server must be having some effect uh, caching the reads because we see fewer, uh, fewer reads in terms of data rate at the disks than the NAS server is seeing. So it must be servicing some out of its caches. When we hop over to the local file system, local NTFS on Windows, again, application workload is, looks exactly the same. <clears throat> And just like in, in Vernon's case, even though he's running a clustered file system and all that, we still see the same workload at the disks as the benchmark is generating at the application level. Change in, change in scale. <clears throat> um, so actually, running with local file systems, my solution managed to scale further. So I actually I took my solution out as, as far as it could go, plus or minus a little bit, just because I didn't want to sit there and tune it all day. Um, so you, so were, you were only able to get to 3.5 gigs per second in the uh, large configuration? Uh, yeah, I was only able to get about 325 megs a second, and whereas with local file systems, local NTFS, so I removed the whole NAS server layer, and I did manage to get it to about 425 uh, megs a second. Um, yes, it's defined, extremely defined as X megabytes per second, or? Yeah, basically, I can't remember the exact, it's, it's a certain number of megabits per second, and then there's a 9 to 1 ratio back to the random reads. Benchmark is basically how many streams, I mean, the, the end result is like how many streams can it sustain? Exactly. And you can see that down here. So in this case, this, this solution running against the local NTFS file systems, we managed to run 100 concurrent streams. Oh, so, so we let graph, for example, if we would, if we would uh, I mean, it stopped at 75, basically, or is that what we, I mean? Yeah, in, for, for, for my runs, I maxed out the storage solution. So with the environment over here running through that NAS server, that environment can only get 75 streams, whereas with local file systems, I did manage to get up to 100 streams. So if you were sizing that environment, you might want to go with, for streaming, you might want to do this instead of having a NAS server in the middle. So it's like, I mean, the end result of the test is like 7,500, I mean, I don't, I don't quite understand the meaning of the graph because either you can take the streams at, at the rate that, I mean, because the stream is something, either you can take it or not. Um, so it's like the end result of, is, is how many streams you can take. Right. Yeah, I mean, that is, that is the point of the benchmark um, if you were to publish, but for the comparisons we're showing here, it's not so much about the, uh, the, the end result of how many business metrics we could get or even the raw numbers on the performance. It's more just looking at how things uh, compare throughout the stack, uh, or just kind of the higher level you know, behavioral differences. It was Windows Server uh, 2012 R2 and Windows 8.1 on the clients. Okay. Uh, how's the mouse authentication Um, so the question is, how is the authentication done in the, in the SMB testing? Um, so that would be for the NAS server environment. And uh, there's only one user in this case. So there, there is some authentication, but that would happen actually way before any results are measured. So that, that portion of the workload isn't, isn't reflected at all in the charts here. And it is pretty lightweight. 
Yeah. yeah. Even though they're linear, there's a fail criteria that's happening on the right hand edge. Which is something yeah. Yeah. We're not focusing on traditional benchmark results here. We're, we just want to show you what's happening at the different layers of the storage stack. At the end of each workload, we do show you a more traditional benchmark results chart with latency, just so, just so you can see what it looks like with the two different solutions. Uh, with the two different configurations. So let's keep on okay. rolling. We're going to look at operations per second now All right. instead and of data rate. So one minor difference between um, the test, Nick ran the test I ran. On the NFS versus local, I just ran the exact same set of load points on both configurations. I didn't really even tune or try and find the absolute maximum for each benchmark um, I was, because I was just looking at comparisons. So we're going we're gonna to now switch to operations per second instead of uh, data rate. Um, so that we can look at what the protocol is doing. So the application is a nice straight line. Um, if we add in the operations per second from NFS, uh, first thing to notice is that for this workload, there's barely any, any metadata. That's the, the purple line. Um, and then the other thing to note is that NFS is actually doing quite a, quite a bit fewer ops per second than the application. And I, I think some of that's just due to the coalescing of, of the large writes. Uh, and if we add in the disk, we see that, again, there's some coalescing compared to the application, uh, but some slight amplification compared to the, the protocol. And on the clustered file system, we don't have NFS anymore, so there's really just the application line, which is exactly the same, and pretty much the same behavior on the disk as we see with NFS. In the Windows environment, again with VDA, looking at ops per second, we get the straight line, ops per second increases uh, as we increase the workload. And we see actually pretty much the same curve. They're SMB stats this time, but we see a little bit of metadata, mostly SMB data operations per second. And we see fewer total SMB operations per second than the benchmark is requesting of the load generators. If we step up to the disk layer, we actually see in this case, the disk IOPS match almost exactly the, app, the benchmarks requested operations per second. Now, IOPS and POSIX operations per second aren't, aren't the same, but you can see there's a high correlation here, which is interesting. Local file systems running as the local NTFS line here, uh, we see actually as the workload scales up, they're fairly small clients, so uh, they, if you remember back to the data rate, we saw the same data rate. But the clients are becoming under more and more cash pressure because they don't have a lot of memory. So my guess is they're, they're just sending smaller and smaller IOs as the load is increasing. So we see increased disk IOPS relative to application operations per second. Um, and so IOS, the data rate's the same, but more IOPS, so the IO size must be less. All right, and then finally, you know, we show the, the typical response time throughput curves that you normally see on a spec result. Um, although in this case we're showing ops per second on the, the x-axis instead of business metric, which you would see in an official submission. But the behavior uh, is similar between the two environments. Uh, what we see is in the, in the local case, uh, we get lower latency, and I think you know, that makes sense because in each case we're actually, there's, from a hardware point of view, there's a shorter path to the storage. Uh, we don't have to go over a, a protocol, um, which is going to add some latency. So every I.O. has a little bit of latency and um, that just makes the, the large sequential writes more efficient. I just wanted to mention everyone, because people are taking pictures. I'm going to make sure that SNEA posts the slides, so don't worry about that. But you feel free to take pictures if you so want to. Just want to make the note. All right, so we'll move on to VDI. VDA tends to be the most predictable of, of the benchmarks. This one's a little more unpredictable. Um, so this is on the NFS environment looking at data rate and this is what the application is doing. The first thing you'll notice is we don't get a nice straight line and this is because at the, at the higher load points uh, the system couldn't keep up with the requested op, uh, operate and so it starts to fail the success criteria. When we add in the network we still see some overhead uh, due to NFS and when we look at the disk we see something kind of strange. First, uh, the writes fairly well aligned with what the network and application are doing. But we see some strange behavior on the reads. Um, early on, there are basically no reads, meaning that the entire file set's getting cached either in the load generators or the NAS server during warm-up. Uh, then as the, the load increases and the caches are broken, um, it has to be serviced from disk. But we see this really strange amplification where by the last load point, um, 
the back end disk is doing three times uh, the read data rate as the application. And um, that was not expected. When we run the exact same test on the clustered file system, we get pretty much exact agreement between um, the application and the disk. So this is clearly something to do with NFS um, that I'll go into more detail a little later. So VDI, you know, VDI is um, mostly small random reads and writes, heavier on the writes, I think about 60%, um, simulating the steady state of a knowledge worker in a, in a, in a VM. So what would the knowledge worker do? Would you open documents? And yeah, yeah, I mean, normal stuff. Yeah, normal stuff we do, check, you know, check email, off, you know, office documents. In the Windows environment, again, looking, staying with data rate, we see the split between reads and writes, same, basically the same as in the NFS environment. That's what the benchmark's requesting. Again, we see very slightly a little bit of overhead in, so the workload's slightly higher going to the NAS server, but basically the, exactly the same. Looking at the disks, we see much more normal looking than, than, than the NFS environment. Uh, we see that the disk writes are maybe a little lower, so maybe there's some cache effect or something. There's a lot of memory in that NAS server. Um, I'm sorry, the reads, there's some read caching. And then we're seeing more writes, so the NAS server is actually amplifying that workload and sending more writes to the back end than it's receiving. If we look at the local file systems and look at what the disks are doing compared to the benchmark, we see actually the same behavior. Uh, the reads are slightly, sm slightly uh, less, uh, but the writes are increased at the disk compared to what uh, the benchmark's issuing. So because this is fairly similar, you could say, well, what's the commonality between these two things? Well, there's an NTFS file system in there. So maybe it's NTFS adding some overhead, or it's just the metadata structures of NTFS adding that overhead. Um, maybe that's it. It's something to at least look at, because that's a commonality between these two environments, and we see such a similar shape. Uh, so if we switch to operations per second, this is back to the NFS environment. Uh, again, we see where it starts to fail at the, the, uh, the higher load points. And for, v, for VDI, at least for NFS, you can see there's basically absolutely no metadata access. And then from the disk point of view, uh, we see some of the same problem as before, although it's not quite as pronounced. And on the local uh, cluster file system, we see a, a bit of a different behavior. There is some uh, disk operations per second amplification, but this is expected just due to the way that the file system handles uh, small writes. So operations per second for VDI in the Windows environment. That's what the benchmark's requesting. We can see the SMB data requests per second match exactly the benchmark's requested operations per second. But the load generators are adding in a whole bunch of metadata. The purple line there. It's almost as much data requests as we're seeing a metadata requests. Um, sorry, almost as many metadata requests as we're seeing data requests. So in the end, the total SMB requests per second, operations per second, is much higher than what the benchmark's requesting. Where will the disks fall? Exactly over the top of the total SMB operations per second. So all the operations per second that the NAS server is seeing it looks like those are being translated exactly to backend IOPS. What happens against local file systems? We see actually a similar picture to the NFS environment. We just see more disk IOPS than we do benchmark requested operations per second. All right, and then finally for VDI, the response time throughput curves. Um, a bit of a difference between the two environments. So with the SMB versus local environment, uh, we see similar results to SM to uh, VDA, the local case kind of has a, a latency advantage at each point. Um, and then for environment two, because of this, this weird behavior, uh, it starts off looking good for NFS due to, due to caching, uh, but then later on, the, this weirdness on the back end disk starts to penalize performance. So I wanted to go into the VDI example for NFS in a little more detail because it, it shed some light on uh, why it's important that we're running the benchmark at an application level. So this is what I showed previously, uh, just looking at the reads. The solid blue line is what SFS 2014 uh, is requesting, and the back in the dotted line is what the backend disk is delivering. Uh, 
So way more reads than are required. And it only happens to be in uh, NFS, so it got me to thinking, what could that be? And I remembered that there there's a parameter that controls um, NFS prefetching. And when I brought this ancient system up, um, I didn't adjust any tuning parameters. It happened to be tuned for more of a sequential workload. In VDI, is not sequential at all. So what was happening is um, this this param since NFS is uh, stateless. Um, back since NFS is stateless if you want to do sequential prefetching uh, there was a heuristic that's that controlled how hard you want to look for a sequential signal in the the all the noise that's coming in from all the workloads that are running against the system and this was set to be fairly it, it was trying pretty hard to look for a sequential signal so what happens is as you increase the load you're increasing the number of files the number of processes and the chance of the heuristic kicking in and giving a false positive um, increases, and, that, and that's what we see. So it's starting, you know, at the higher levels of load. It thinks there's a sequential pattern, so it's just prefetching as much as it can from the backend disk. So I tune that parameter um, to be more for a, a random workload, and then this is the response I got from the disk. Almost there. I was kind of surprised that it wasn't. Um, the same as the application. And then it, it reminded me of another parameter that controls prefetching and how aggressive it is. So I, I tune that and I, I get back to the um, expected performance. So the reason why I left this in here rather than just tuning it and rerunning is I think it illustrates some of the benefit of running the benchmark at the application level. Because um, this is kind of a realistic scenario. You could imagine that if this system were at a customer and for whatever reason those parameters were set wrong, they might call the vendor and say, you know, during peak hours when all the VMs are, are spun up, you know, my backend disk goes crazy and it starts affecting other workloads. Um, and, and the benchmark caught that. So it, it increases the number of processes and files in a fairly re realistic way um, that we probably wouldn't have caught if we were running the benchmark uh, some other way or isolating just some component in the system. That's, that's true. I, I, I wondered that too about all the workloads. But. And the question is, I wonder what would happen after that tuning, what would happen with the VDA workload? Just to get that on recording. Yeah. Oh. yeah. So last, the last one we're going to cover is software build. Yes. So the question is on the VDI workload, and um, it the VDI workload is really meant to simulate the workload coming out of a hypervisor, um, but the unit of workload is a number of VDI desktops. Um, but it does it simulates the the workload generated by people you know using VDI desktops. It's not actually doing that. It's it's a synthetically derived um, workload to match that as, as best as possible. Would be reasonable also to, to say that it's applicable to uh, people with um, laptops or whatever the thing. You know, oh yeah, so so is it applicable to like you know a real what real users are doing with laptops? Um, I'd say it's fairly close. It's probably not absolutely perfect for that because again, it is sort of meant to be what's coming out of a hypervisor. So there are some differences there. So it's not perfect, but it can be used for that purpose. Does that help? Okay, thank you. All right. So the last workload, uh, um, software build. This is the NFS environment uh, from the application's point of view. It, it's pretty much 50-50 uh, in terms of reads and writes. And, and when we add in the network layer, you can, you can see that obviously a lot less is going over the network. Uh, and that's because the, the load generators play a pretty big role for software build. There's lots of caching of the, the file metadata and, and even the, the, the files themselves. If we look at the disk, um, 
again, there's still a lot of caching. We can see the, the effects of the caching and the load generators and, and the NAS servers. We do see a little bit more going to the disk than over the network, and that's probably due to um, you know keeping the file system consistent and a lot, there's going to be a lot of um, logging uh, probably compared to some of the other benchmarks. And running directly on the clustered file system, we see basically the, the same ratio of, of uh, disk data rate to application data rate. In the Windows environment, we see again, saying 50-50 requested by the benchmark. In this case, we actually see very close to 50-50 requested of the NAS server, just at a much lower magnitude. And then from the disks, we see, this is really cool, actually there were no reads serviced by the disks at all. All of the reads were serviced out of that NAS server. Um, but of course, to, to be consistent, we had to write out to the disks themselves. And in the end, we did see some write amplification like, like Vernon saw in his environment as well. Against local disks, again, 50-50 mix. Um, without the NAS server involved, of course, we actually do see some reads uh, at the disk layer because there's nothing in the middle to cache them all. Um, but we see a very similar relationship to what Vernon saw in terms of uh, data rates at the disk layer versus the benchmark. Question? I can understand the zero reads, and there's got to be some reads at the beginning, right, to, to populate the cache, that, and they're just probably very small, so they're not showing up. So the question is, there there've got to be some reads at the start to populate the cache. Um, not necessarily, because the, 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 it's creating the data set, and that's going through the NAS server, so it may hold it all in cache and flush it. Regardless, there is also a five minute warm up period before the measurement period. So um, at that point, you know, that could be pulling it all in. But I'm, I'm guessing it was probably all just left in memory after it was written out during data set creation. Um, but it's a good question to ask. Okay. What is the duration of the data sets? You just said that five minute warm up before each one. So, so you would do a load of one and then a five minute so the question is sort of how the benchmark operates. Yeah. Um, it goes through phases. So what we here we requested two software builds. So what the benchmark is going to do is it's going to create the data set to support two software builds. There's a fixed relationship between one software build and the amount of data set in terms of files and directories and, and all that. And then it's going to do a five minute warm up, and that's user definable. Actually, people can change the warm up time to whatever. And then there's a, a five minute measurement period, and that's not changeable. <laughs> um, it could be changed, but there's really sort of no, no reason, because uh, the warm-up time will sort of ensure you're in a steady state scenario. And if you're not, then that's when you'd probably want to extend it to make sure you are. Uh, and that's why that's flexible. So. That too, and then you do another warm-up period when you reset to four. Right. And and exactly. And then that cycle continues for every requested uh, load point. <clears throat> All right, if we look at um, ops per second instead of data rate, Nice straight line for the application. For NFS, uh, in this case, you know, compared to some of the other ones, there's basically no, there's very little data uh, op operations. It's very heavy on metadata. Uh, I think that's something like 70 or 80 percent of the workload. Um, and, and in fact, there's there there are more NFS operations per second than the applications requesting, and, and some of this is due to you know, how SFS defines an operation and, and, you know, that may actually chain to multiple sequential operations that for NFS is, is probably the reason for the amplification there. I'd blame POSIX, not SFS, though. Right. Um, and then looking at the disk, it, it happens to correlate closely with uh, the application. Um, I think some of this is coincidental, though. It's probably due to the fact that the, the I.O. transfer sizes are, are similar uh, at the disk and the application. Then when we bypass NFS and run directly on the clustered file system, uh, we see pretty much the same thing as NFS. The, the disk operations per second uh, correlates fairly closely. In the Windows environment, we again see this is what the benchmarks requesting in terms of IOPS. We see the same sort of pattern, very little data operations. And we actually are seeing, I think it's, it's even more in the way of med SMB metadata operations thus total SMB operations versus what the benchmark's requesting. Now, where does the disk fall? All right, so the disk IOPS are very heavily correlated to the actual SMB data operations uh, that the NAS server is seeing. 
we go to the local file systems application, and similar thing, few, fewer disk IOPS uh, in this case than the benchmarks requesting, but we do see more disk IOPS than with the NAS server in the middle sort of acting as a buffer, catching a lot of the metadata ops and all that. All right, and then the response time throughput curves, uh, a little bit of a mixed mix of results between the two environments. So for the SMB versus local environment, um, although there, there are lower lower average response times for SMB, the, in the local case, um, was, they're able to drive it to higher low levels at the, you know, at the expense of some additional response time. And in the, the environment two, NFS compared to local, um, it looks like NFS has an advantage in, in caching the metadata, which is probably why we see the, the, the better response times. Yeah, that's what I mean, yeah. Uh, and then finally, I wanted to show some data that, that comes with SFS that we, we didn't show previously. You have to dig a little bit for it. Um, but every, every load point produces a, a latency histogram. Uh, and I think there's something like 22 buckets all the way from 20 microseconds up to two minutes of the top case. Um, and if you, if you aggregate all these histograms across an entire uh, set of load points, you can create a heat map, and sometimes just, just staring at the heat map can show you some interesting behavior, or at least tell you where, where a lot of the, the caching is occurring. So this is in the NFS case, comparing NFS to the local clustered file system uh, for the, you know, the same set of requested load points. For software. Yeah, for software build. Um, and so we can point out some, some features, illuminating features here. So first, on the, the local side, you know, there's a clear kind of green line at around 40 microseconds. That's, that's definitely not enough time to get from the load generator to the NAS server in the NFS case. So this is um, a cache hit from the client. Um, and there are consistently, going over NFS, there's actually, you can't see them on the projector, but there are consistent bands of, I'd say probably about 5% of the IOs wind up in the 20 or 40 microsecond bucket. So there's consistent cache hits there, but nothing like the uh, 60 to 70% we're seeing here. And there's another caching band um, that we can see at around you know, 200 microseconds. And that, that is really the, kind of the round trip time to get from the NFS clients to the, uh, to the server. And, that, and that's you know, probably why we see it brighter on the NFS side than the local side. And there's, there's kind of one more noticeable caching band that occurs in both, both charts at around uh, 800 microseconds. Um, and this one we don't know for sure, but th that's roughly the time it takes to get from uh, these front end nodes to the back end nodes into the, the storage subsystems cache. And so that, that's probably um, the cache hits from the, the disk controller. And then lastly, the, the, the rest of the accesses from four milliseconds up to 40 milliseconds, uh, those are the requests that have to be serviced from the, the back end disk. I love those, those heat maps, they're really cool. Um, so just to sort of summarize what we said here, SPEC SFS 2014, unlike previous versions, it's an application level benchmark and it tests the storage performance of an entire storage solution all the way from load generators through to the disks. Uh, understanding the storage solution under test and placing your bottlenecks correctly are the keys to getting what you expect from your storage solution if you're trying to publish. Conversely, if you're just storage developers, um, running the benchmark and analyzing what's happening at the different layers can help you to understand your system and where the bottlenecks may be to try to improve them, shift them, you know, improve performance at different layers. And uh, that, the application level benchmarking uh, that we are doing in SFS 2014 allows testing a much wider array of, of products and solutions than previous benchmarks allowed. As you saw, we have block storage with file systems, which is sort of one step into the wild world of everything that's out there nowadays. So that's it. Any more questions? Um, uh, kind of a specific detail, but on SMB testing, uh, can you do both uh, UNC paths and mounted drives? Uh, so the question is on SMB testing, can you do UNC paths and local drives? Yes.
Most of the time you're probably going to want to do UNC paths if you're doing an SMB server, um, but certainly you could, uh, you could, could just- Do a mounted drive, like a Z drive. Yes. Different characteristics between whether you mount it persistently or have the- Yeah, exactly. Um, I started, I started and I was gonna just put my NTFS file system under a directory instead of the E drive, then I'm like, why am I doing this? Just use the E drive. <laughs> but for the NAS testing, I just gave it the UNC path, you know, whack, whack, server name, whack, FS0. Okay. Are there many published results from the vendors? Yeah. Or? So, yeah, so far, so the question was, are there any published results? And no, there aren't any results so far. Uh, it came out last November. Um, so it's almost been, been a year. And, uh, you know, I think some of the reasons for that are, First, there, well, first is what we talked about here. It, it's so different. Um, it's going to require a lot more tuning on the vendor's part to be sure that they're getting the best result. The other is they have to pick which, which of the four they really want to focus on. Uh, and then lastly, uh, uh, and then lastly, you know, once there's one out there, I'm sure a lot more vendors will have something they want to beat. And, and so it's really that first one that's just going to take some time. We welcome publication. <laughs> are, are we out of time? Yeah, we're out of time. Okay, so I want to thank everyone for attending, and also please remember to submit feedback. I know it's the last day, but we appreciate it. Thank you.